Uh, next up, we have our CARA Roundtable discussion. And here to moderate the discussion is Maggie Reardon over here, uh, who is a senior writer with CNET, uh, CBS Interactive. Maggie covers telecom, the telecom beat, from, and has for over a decade. Uh, since 2003, she served as the senior writer for CNET News, CNET News, CNET News, covering all things wireless and broadband. From the launch of the latest iPhone, uh, major telephone company mergers, acquisitions, spectrum policy issues, uh, she's, she's got it all covered. She frequently appears as an expert on major uh, news networks. And uh, the Ask Maggie column uh, offers readers advice and insight uh, twice a week on wireless data plans, uh, smartphones, iPhones, speculation, uh, what's coming, what's new, anything wireless. Uh, so let me add a personal note. Uh, congratulations is, a, is in order to Maggie, since she just returned from her honeymoon. <laughs> Very good. So we are indeed glad that she uh, uh, came back for uh, just for us. Uh, that was so nice of you. So uh, it, it's great to have you, Maggie. I really appreciate it. So let, please uh, welcome and give it up for uh, Maggie Reardon, and I'll let her introduce her panels. Here you go. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Well, um, we've got a whole lineup here of, of great executives from competitive carriers, so I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves uh, just briefly, and then we're going to get into um, a really great discussion, and we're going to try to leave uh, a little bit of time at the end for questions from the audience. So um, as we're chatting, if you've got some ideas, uh, definitely make a mental note, and I'll, I'll try to call on you at the end. Okay, so let's start here. I've got Mike Pryor to my, my left. Go ahead, sure. Mike. Hi, I'm uh, CEO of Atlantic Tele-Network. We're a public company and we have a number of different uh, operating companies, but relevant uh, to this gathering, uh, our two most significant wireless companies are in the U.S., uh, the last remaining Alltel properties, and we also have a uh, white space build roaming only business, a kind of shared infrastructure business that we built out west, uh, mainly out in the southwest. Okay, next we have Pat Reardon. I'm no Pat relation. Rudin, I'm Maggie's cousin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, president and CEO of uh, Cellcom. We're located up in uh, Wisconsin. The home base is Green Bay, Wisconsin. I don't care what Jim says. We all know. We all saw the play. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Hugh Mina. I'm not related to Pat. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, anyway, uh, I operate Ceasefire Wireless. We are in four southeastern states, all of Mississippi mm -hmm. and parts of Tennessee, Alabama, Florida, and a little bit of Arkansas. Yeah. I am Eric Prush. I'm the CEO for Clearwire. Uh, we are a uh, mobile broadband player uh, trying to change the world and, uh, and do it through a retail business and a wholesale business um, and really trying to uh, grow the industry using 4G data. Hi, and I'm Linda Martin, and I'm president of PC Management, a services and management company that's been building competitive carriers uh, since 1990. So for about 22 years, we've built and operated uh, about 15 carriers and another 20 or so uh, virtual operators, and we're located in uh, Naples, Florida. Goodness. Okay. I did, did that. I do was that. me. Um, uh, so we're going to kick off uh, this first question. It's going to be for you, uh, Hugh. Um, I don't know how many of you in the audience were at the meeting this morning, but Hugh talked about the duopoly of AT&T and Verizon. And, and the question I have is, you know, we always, we always hear about this duopoly and how, you know, this isn't a good thing. But my question from a consumer standpoint is, it, is it really not a good thing? I mean, consumers are getting uh, some of the hottest devices. We've got AT&T and Verizon leading in, in LTE deployment. Why do we need competitive carriers? Well, I'll go back to the uh, example that Jim used in the previous session. He talked about Maxwell, Hill and Maxwell House and Folgers dominating the coffee space. One difference is that Maxwell House and Folgers did not block Starbucks from acquiring the upper end coffee. I don't, I don't know enough about coffee to say. And that's what, what happens when two, when, when two companies in, a, in, in, in this industry who have a background, a history that goes back to a monopoly that they had in place for 100 years before they were broken up. That is the mindset. That's what they think about. In other industries, it is not, it's not a bad thing to be big. It, and, 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 but 
The problem that we've had is that when uh, the two largest carriers achieve scale, they block others from receiving industry inputs, like the latest in devices and like roaming and to some extent spectrum. You have to have the industry inputs to, co to compete. And I'm all for competition. Competition is what makes the world go round in business. I'm all for it. But it ought to be a level playing field, and the duopoly should not be able to determine what inputs uh, other competitors receive. Well, let me follow up, and, and anyone here can jump in. Um, from a consumer standpoint, why is it important? Like, why should I care? Um, you know, I, my needs are being met by Verizon and at and I want the iPhone. So, yeah, it. you have iPhone. You, uh, some carriers, including us and Sprint and uh, T-Mobile, offer unlimited service. You may not have a need for unlimited, but uh, they, there are other carriers who offer unlimited services. There are others who package their rate plans in a variety of different ways. It's interesting to see that if one, uh, if one bail company raises their rates or changes their rates, about a week later, the other one does the same thing. The package one week and then they, the other one repackages to look a lot like it the next week. You see those type things happen in our industry. We need a competitive environment like it's always been. It needs to sustain. We have, you know, we have 100 carriers here. Uh, you, can, you can look at the financial uh, reports of the public companies who are not AT&T and Verizon and, and see there's some challenges out there. And uh, uh, so I think that, that is why it's not, you know, there's certainly nice devices on the marketplace today. But do we want to make sure that for the consumers in this country, that we want to make sure that they have access to the latest and greatest devices at affordable, flexible, attractive rates in the long run? We saw what happened to telephony when it was controlled by monopolistic powers up until the, mid, the early 1980s. Nothing happened. Uh, and, and then, but since then, it's just a whole completely different world. We do not want to revert back to that era we want to perpetuate and continue the, uh, the uh, atmosphere and environment of competition that was so important to the growth of wireless in the 1990s and uh, the first half of the last decade. Maggie, I think what you're looking at is when you only have two, you, you, you don't have the out-of-box uh, thinking which you really need to have in an industry. I think that's what competition allows for is out-of-the-box thinking. Uh, you get much more, uh, much more in the way of scale of services being offered. Uh, customer service becomes a key as we, we listen to uh, Jim talk about the fact that customer service is a, a critical element and the need for your employees to believe in it and to, to go that extra step. And I think that's one of the things that competition brings. I think um, new, new types of services, uh, for instance, we offer We've got a couple of our cell sites which happen to be operated by solar power. Well, that's not something that's done without out-of-the-box type of thinking. Um, we've, we actually have a coffee house that works with one of our, our uh, cellular uh, operations to drive business into that, uh, that retail store. So there's a lot of things you can do that are different from what two companies can do. So it's a matter of being competitive and having the customers decide how many uh, competitors there should be. Well, I was going to, the next, this leads into my next question. Um, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here because obviously all of you here are, are for competition and a lot of competition, but I think there are some economists out there who would argue that, um, yes, competition is good, but, uh, you know, you can't have too much competition, right? I mean, uh, this is an expensive business, infrastructure is expensive. How many competitors are necessary? in a market? Is it, is it the market three, is it four? I, I, I really believe the market decides that. Well, yeah, and I, and I think, just to take it back to the, the coffee analogy, I know, I guess we're stuck on that today. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a good one. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, I, but I think if you, if you think about it, when there was Folgers and Maxwell House, the consumer didn't know they needed uh, Starbucks. They didn't know they needed to spend $4.65 for a simple cup of coffee every day. Um, but they did, right? And uh, you saw the demand. I mean, I think the numbers he gave were 24,000 between Starbucks and the other uh, collective coffee houses, and really there didn't seem to be a need for competition. So I think you, you let the market decide. Well, what is the market deciding? I mean, what, what, where, I, I think that's sort of the big question where we are in terms of of what the policy should be for the government. I mean, do you think we're at a good point now, or do you think, 
you know, I've talked to some analysts who say more consolidation is coming. And I think at your, end, at your meeting this morning, you acknowledged that it, it may be hard to grow this organization because of consolidation. Um, should more consolidation occur? Or do you think that we're at a point where we're at a good number of competitors now? We don't know until there's a level playing field. We don't know how many okay. competitors we need. If there's a level playing field, let's battle it out. But when, you know, we, we talk about the interoperability issue, that prevents many of us in this room from having the latest and greatest devices, especially at the LTE, at the LTE level. We don't, so we don't really know what would happen in a level playing, playing field today. We saw what happened, um, you know, for the, for the first 20 years of the industry or so. There was a lot of competition many healthy carriers in every market, but now you see AT&T and Verizon pretty much dominating the landscape, and uh, that is because they, it's one industry input they block through interoperability. And so if we, have a, uh, uh, if we have a level playing field, we'll all get out there and play, and we'll see how many competitors are left. And that's all we're asking for is a level playing field. All right. Um, this leads to my next question about what is the role of, of government? And, and Linda, I don't know if you want to chime in here. I mean, what, what do you think um, the FCC should be doing? Are they doing enough? Well, I, I don't think they're doing enough, but I think they're certainly moving in the right direction. So I, I think that the role of the FCC is to protect uh, the consumer, protect the industry, ensure competition, ensure a level playing field, as Hugh mentioned and then let the free market decide. Um, competition is good, we all expect to compete, uh, but there has to be a level playing field and I think there has to be a balance between a free market society and enough regulation to ensure that there is a level playing field and, and fair competition. All right. Does anybody else want to? Well, I, I just think you, what you have to remember is telecom is an infrastructure business, right? And uh, so that, and on the one hand, it makes consolidation, uh, you know, often a very smart business decision and often can in introduce new efficiencies and benefits to consumers. But at the same time, it is an infrastructure business. It's a nationwide infrastructure business. And the government, if the government has any role, it is to make sure infrastructure uh, is interoperable and is, and is done in a way that, that works for the entire country. So, you know, when you had railways, they used to be dozens and dozens of railways um, that consolidated over time, but they weren't going to let, the government wouldn't have let one railway say, look, we're going to use a narrower gauge rail, mm -hmm. you know, and you just, you just can't drive your train onto our tracks. I mean, so if the market lets it happen, that's fine. I think what everyone here is just asking for is uh, the FCC to use its role to kind of mediate, mediate those infrastructure decisions. I, I, just to jump in, sure. I, you know, I think the idea of, of more competition leading to greater innovation, which ultimately determines growth. Um, we at Clearwire clearly think that the FCC's role is a light touch role. It, it's, it is meant to, to create greater competition, to drive innovation in the space. Uh, we think that what we're doing from a wholesale standpoint is trying to create a more competitive environment. We're trying to bring spectrum, which is the key, even before interoperability, to everybody and to anybody, and to allow all carriers to be able to participate and innovate and continue to innovate their offerings to compete with the large carriers. Okay. We keep hearing about a uh, spectrum crunch, and um, you know our last keynote speaker here um, talked about spectrum is, is T-Mobile's main issue. Um, how is this affecting smaller carriers? And Eric, I don't know if you want to accept this. We're in a unique position. We are smaller, uh, and yet we've got 160 megahertz or 47 billion megahertz pops of spectrum. And we're trying to commercialize that spectrum and trying to create a fat pipe for everybody to participate on. Uh, that cr creates the economy of scale for smaller players to compete effectively against the large carriers. Uh, the spectrum crunch is here. Uh, whether some admit it or not, we think it's all moving forward. Demand in the space has grown exponentially over the last couple of years, and it is the key resource. It is the key piece of fuel that's necessary in order to spur growth on into the future, and the, the FCC's role, as well as all the, all the competitive carriers' role, is to figure out how to best to use the spectrum that we've got available and make certain that it's most efficiently used. We've got our, our unique position in terms of being able to help that, um, but all players can innovate around it, and we're excited about that. 
just want to talk about how it's affecting your, I mean, how is it affecting your business? Are you not able to, uh, to grow as much as you'd like? Well, I, I, you know, I think, I think that, I mean, for our part, we're in very rural areas, and for now, we have enough spectrum, but, you know, this is a, again, this is an in infrastructure business that you have to have long-term planning, and we can see very clearly that we will run into difficulties if we don't have more spectrum, just the, just the data demand that occurs. And, and you have some alternatives. You can, you know, you can sell split, um, you can do other things, but that just raises your cost and it reduces your competitive competitiveness. So um, spectrum, is, spectrum is really critical table stakes for everybody, I think. And it's not just a matter of spectrum. It has to be the right spectrum. I mean, if we get spectrum that nobody produces a product for, it really doesn't do us any good. So, and because 70% of the market is, you know, belongs to two carriers, we really do have to have some sort of, some sort of roaming arrangement uh, on that spectrum, and we need to have access to that spectrum. So that, that's kind of an important part of this, because it's, it's not a matter of just coming out with just any old spectrum, it has to be the right spectrum and we have to have an interoperability. You can't really divide, in my mind, you can't really divide spectrum and interoperability. They have to be looked at in the same, almost in the same uh, sentence. Right. Um, again, I'm gonna play devil's advocate a little bit here. Um, Verizon and AT&T would argue, we roam with other people. We have lots of agreements with other carriers. You know, we're, we're not trying to shut anybody out and, um, you know, interoperability, you know, you look at LTE, uh, I think it was um, AT&T had a blog post, maybe was it last week or the week before, talking about, you know, if you're going to make us, um, LTE, there, there are so many different permeations of that, you can't focus on uh, the FCC making one band class uh, specific to call out to, to make that interoperable. So I guess, you, you know, my question is, is these guys say that they're, they're able to roam and, and that they're being interoperable, um, and you guys are just big whiners and complainers. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I, I don't think it's a question of whining and complaining. I, I think it is bringing it to reality of, of interoperability and commercially feasible interoperability as well. And um, I think from the very early days of uh, two carriers through the PCS auctions and onward, there's always been an interoperability mandate. There's always been a roaming mandate. The, um, the carriers have been required to allow roaming on their network and to provide roaming services to other carrier subscribers. And for the first time with the newer spectrum and 700 megahertz, that's not a requirement, and um, the big guys are using that as an excuse to carve out a, a part of the market and keep everybody else out. And that ultimately is hurting consumers, not only is hurting competitive carriers, but it's hurting consumers from a device choice to a provider choice. And we believe that providers um, should be able to provide services to other carriers, just as they always have historically, and that consumers should have the right to choose the provider regardless of where they live. Okay. Um, yeah, Maggie, let me add on some. Yeah, when you're around the coffee pot, ask some of the people here about trying to uh, obtain a 4G roaming agreement or even a 3G roaming agreement from the two that you just mentioned. See what you see what you might learn. Um, I would say, you know, we talked about today that there's 100 carriers in our trade association. All in our trade association agree with our position on interoperability. Agree with our position on roaming. And I'll, <clears throat> there's only two that don't. And so maybe there are two whiners and there's a hundred who are not whiners because there's a hundred who are really committed to this industry. <laughs> Yeah. Treading on dangerous territory, playing the, the Verizon uh, AT&T card here. Maggie, I see you're coming yeah. up with some tomatoes here. You better be careful. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the deal that was made between Verizon and cable, because I, I think that was a real important um, policy uh, moment that, that just happened. And I think everybody here knows uh, what happened there, the, the FCC 
and DOJ allowed uh, Verizon to buy some spectrum from the cable operators. And I'm just, you know, there were some conditions put on that deal, but I'm just wondering from this panel, do you think that the FCC went far enough? You know, when I had a conversation with, with Steve Barry uh, before this happened, he said he thought this was a really great policy opportunity that the FCC could, could push ahead some of these competitive policies. So, so what do you think? Who, this is a toss-up. Who wants to grab it? Well, of course, I, I think we, we would have liked to have seen it go a little further. Um, I, I agree um, in terms of a light-handed um, regulatory environment. On the other hand, this was a great opportunity for the FCC to um, make sure that we got interoperability, uh, you know, make sure that there's data roaming that is solid and commercially feasible. And um, I, I think that they got, you know, moved in the right direction, as I said before, but came a little bit short of what could have been done at this very historic moment. What would you have liked to, what would you have wanted to see them do that they didn't do, if you could say? I, I would have liked to see them, you know, if they're saying we're going to let you buy this enormous uh, swath of spectrum, which I agree, you know, Generally, you've got to be careful about interfering with the market there and have a light hand, but I think it would have been appropriate to say, look, we already put out this data roaming order. Let's see a real commitment to that, because I think it's, it's linked somewhat with that, uh, you know, deeper, broader, um, you know, spectrum holdings that Verizon was acquiring through this. So, and, you know, and I think it was good that they, they made them divest some of it, you know, one of the CCA members certainly has benefited from that, but, um, you know, we, we for one, we're in the uh, FCC uh, saying, why don't, you, why don't you make them give some of that into the rural areas, divest it to the rural areas, because in the rural areas, the, the, the big two often are sitting on a very large amount of spectrum that is not used, uh, while the smaller operators are, are really scraping down at the bottom of the barrel. So. That would have been a nice outcome, however it could have happened. But, um, I mean, Verizon, Verizon agreed to some roaming uh, provisions in that, or not, was it not, didn't go far enough for your liking? I, you know, I, maybe I'm out of touch, but I didn't read anything that said they've agreed to something concrete, you know, and I think if you remember the old days of uh, the, the competitive uh, wireline industry getting a launch, it's, uh, you know, you, you really have to have very tangible, specific, definitive agreement to, for, you know, small carriers to go and be able to take advantage of it. Right, right. Um, now, getting back to, to this idea of LTE, and, you know, we've mentioned 700 megahertz, um, you know, that spectrum has been sliced and diced over the years, and, and there are some technical issues that make it... Um, not possible for everybody to use the same chipsets when they're deploying LTE. How has this sort of fragmentation in terms of the spectrum affected your business and your ability to roll out LTE? Um, Pat, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Well, in our case, we, we became an LRA uh, member, so we actually have rolled out LTE and we're rolling it out on uh, Verizon's network, so we have nationwide roaming based on that. But as we look at our own core, which we'll have to come up with, you know, the, the fact that Verizon has band 13 all to themselves across the entire United States really changing the dynamics very uh, strongly so that they've got a system that they don't really need anybody's help to, to build out. And that needs to become something that, uh, and they've agreed to the fact that that people can roam on, it just hasn't happened as of yet. And that's something that has to take place. Because we need to be able to have our own core and we need to be able to roam nationwide and we need to have choices in roaming nationwide. I think one of the things that may end up helping us is the fact that the iPhones come out and the iPhones include a chipset that has both the band 13, which is Verizon's band, and also band 25, which is what Sprint will be roaming on. So there's a chance that we have uh, an opportunity because of a manufacturer uh, with a, an iconic phone that's going to force people into more of, a, more of a band that allows more people to compete. We need more of that because we're not convinced, I think, as, as overall competitors that there is a real reason as to why the 700 band couldn't have been kept together. 
In, in this room, there are those who have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on uh, 700 megahertz spectrum, probably measured in the billions. I just don't know the, the real number, uh, the, the, the total number. But I, I think all of those were, these are people in the representative room who've been uh, in the, some have been in the landline business, some have been, many have been in the wireless business for years and years. We want to build. And so uh, you had the spectrum, prime beachfront spectrum, as it was called in the auction, 700 megahertz, and it's sitting fallow on the sidelines. Uh, that's a loss of jobs in markets. That's a loss of economic development. That's a loss of consumer uh, happiness with the services that uh, carriers like all of us can provide. So it has been, it's been a major factor by the, uh, uh, with the two uh, 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 Bell companies going off and, and dividing and breaking out their own proprietary band classes and leaving the rest of us out. Because when, we, when some of us, a company our size, goes to a device manufacturer, we're talking to them about maybe, maybe hundreds of thousands of devices. They want to hear about tens of millions of devices. That's just the way the world uh, e uh, device ecosystem works. And because we don't have a, a, the same ecosystem as some of the larger uh, carriers, then we're not able to deploy the, uh, the, the highly regarded 700 megahertz spectrum. And Pat's company was, was creative and found us a way around it, and, and, and good, good for him. We've been able to redeploy some PCS spectrum, and we've launched with band class 25 LTE. So uh, there are ways around it, but the, we ought to all be able to use the spectrum which we've procured to be able to offer broadband services throughout this nation in the metro areas and the rural areas, because that's what consumers in the United States want. Right. Um, and I'm probably going to get tomatoes thrown at me now to, you know, as I press you a little bit on this. But, I mean, isn't it a technical issue, right? I mean, I think what we're talking about here is, you know, the the A band in the, in the lower 700 megahertz versus the, the, the B block uh, that AT&T bought and is using, right? And, you know, I think AT&T's argument would be, you know, you got that A block cheap because people knew that there were interference issues. And so that's on you. You know, you're the one who bought, you know, beachfront property, but it floods. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. We, we didn't get it cheap. It was, we, play, we paid a fair market value for that spectrum, but uh, I don't know why AT&T is worried about our devices having interference. We're not worried about it if we were able to have access to those devices. So that is, that is not an argument uh, uh, that they should be making on our behalf. We want to, and, and it's not just lower A, it's lower B and lower C. It's all of band class 12. And uh, that's, there's not enough developmental effort going on internationally on band class 12 because there's not enough scale there. And if if the uh, industry would have followed and the FCC would have required uh, the following of what happened in the original cellular licenses between A and B interoperability, then with PCS, with uh, uh, A through F, I believe, interoperability, as well as AWS, then uh, we would not be in this boat. But at, this, at the point in time when the 700 megahertz auction occurred, uh, after that there was enough market power to drive individual band classes for Verizon, individual band class for AT&T. And so that's, um, that is an un unfortunate happening in our industry. It's unfortunate for the people in this room because we would all love to be able to uh, have a vibrant band class 12 solution utilizing this beachfront spectrum uh, so that, do that does not flood. Well, where do we go from here then, right? I mean, if, if it's sort of the band class has already been decided, is there, is there a solution? Well, we think, uh, we think the, that the FCC could possibly act to, uh, to ensure that band class 12 is the, uh, is, it becomes interoperable and it becomes the uh, lower uh, spectrum of choice, lower band class of choice, and we'll just see if they, uh, if they move on that here in the next few months. Okay. Okay. Um, just wanted to get to some other questions here. Um, and and this, this one's for you, Eric. Uh, there are a number of options available, you know, talking about uh, expanding capacity re resources and getting new spectrum out. You know, we've got auctions, spectrum sharing, and wholesale access. Um, 
I mean, what would you say that the pros and cons are for uh, the options that are currently being considered? You know, we've got the, the incentive auctions that, you know, we're going to hear something from the FCC this week about, but what do you, what do you think? Yeah, look, I think we need to make certain that we utilize all the available spectrum today. And I think what we're hearing is, yes, there's interoperability challenges. Most of that's driven by chipsets. Uh, but what we're trying to do, slightly different. We're trying to, to make certain that there is availability for everybody. And we're trying to allow for that innovation to occur, not only with the competitive carriers, but with others in the marketplace as well. You've got to effectively use the spectrum that we have available. And there is enough spectrum today to meet um, you know, kind of the current year needs, but we then need to move quickly to how do we more efficiently get spectrum available in the future. The more that the FCC and industry can come together in terms of identifying that, utilizing it more effectively, the better off everyone is going to be. And I'm really talking about consumers, consumer behavior. Since we operate at the high frequency range and we have a very broad base of, of spectrum, the deepest in the industry, the, the ability for us to mobilize on that and create something different, compelling, um, is there. But that has to be matched up, and that has to be embedded in the chipsets that are available, and it has to allow for all to participate on an economic basis. The more we can stimulate that, I think the more successful everybody's going to be. Okay. Um, you know, we, we've got uh, some FCC things that are coming up this week in terms of um, the incentive auctions. I mean, how important are incentive auctions going to be for, for your businesses? I mean, is this spectrum that you think um, you'll be able to, to put to use, you know, in, in rural areas? Is, is this going to be a big deal for you? I, I think I've been told, I hope I, where Doug is, that I'm not supposed to say more. Uh, okay, if you're sorry. in the, if you're going to participate in the auction, you're not really supposed to talk about it. Oh, okay. Okay. So, I'll pass. How about okay. you, Pat? <laughs> well, thanks a lot. <laughs> abstract. I mean, maybe not specific to your business, but, you know, is this, um, you know, we've heard so much about incentive auctions, sure. and the FCC's been I think piping the, it up, but is it enough? I think it's important, whether it's, it's, it's never going to be enough. I mean, there's always going to be need for more and more spectrum. I, I think that's generally a principle we can expect for at least mm -hmm. the next 10 years. What I think is important is this time we've got to get it right. We didn't get it right with a 700 auction. That was a disaster. We cannot have another 700 auction like that. We need to make sure that this auction is in small bites so that everybody has a chance at it. We can, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I certainly do not want to see any nationwide auction taking place where somebody can grab uh, the whole nation uh, based on that because there's so few bidders that can even get into that. We need to have this thing done in as small bites as we can possibly do so everybody gets a chance to participate and that we get a good stirring of the pot so that we don't end up with a situation that to me has been disastrous with the 700 auction. Well, I'm gonna to have to ask you to elaborate a little bit in terms of sure. what I mean, specifically was disastrous. Specifically, we had Verizon picked up band 13 nationwide. They were able to have an exclusive band. Uh, Verizon or uh, AT&T has had Similar, we're able to set up basically, as we talked about, kind of an exclusive band. We need something. After the auction, they set that up. Right. Go ahead. But it, it, it happened. And we, we need to make sure that this time we don't have nationwide. Uh, we, need to, we can't afford to have nationwide um, spectrum given out to a single carrier, in my mind, because we need to, first of all, Talking about cheap, the cheapest spectrum was band 13. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that, if you want to compare them, uh, Verizon got the best deal. I mean, that's... that's a good point. It's, it's a fact. I mean, you can look it up and see it. But, but do so you think it, that was it, because it, of the It reduces, it reduces the price because it reduces the number of people that can bid on right. it. As, as you get larger and larger, you get fewer bidders. So you're going to get less money as far as the government's concerned. And you're also going to limit who can bid on it. So I guess that's the takeaway I have is make it in small bites as you can. But is, are smaller bites enough in terms of, you know, I was talking to someone who was saying, you know, even if they're smaller licenses, you can still have AT&T and Verizon kind of working together in some fashion to, to cobble together a nationwide 
uh, set of licenses. So is that enough? Do, well, I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't work together. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that it becomes a situation where they have an auction for each small item. At least you've got a competitive situation where we know that they may have the most money, but they, they're going to have multiple auction, multiple things to do at the same time. And you get a chance to bid on what you really need as far as a small carrier goes. You know that this, this area I need, I'll put more money into it because that's the exact area I need. So I think there's going to be a lot more competition. You're going to get a lot higher prices for it. Verizon, AT&T, and all the other companies are going to have to pay more money for it. So the government ends up with more money. And we get a chance to bid on what we really need to bid on. Yeah, an, an example, and, and I'm not talking about the specific auction, right? Right. Uh, but an example would be for us, you know, we're in, we're in Georgia, right? We're in rural areas of Georgia, for, for example, of one state. If they just had a statewide license being offered, we're not in Atlanta. Um, you know, we're not in Savannah. We're, but, you know, Atlanta, Atlanta alone. We, there's no way we can bid competitively with somebody who is in both Atlanta and the rural areas. The flip side is the... The carriers that are in the metro areas will have, you know, more competition for the license in Atlanta. So, they, you know, there is a hurdle for them to go maybe to the same level in the rural areas and the smaller areas as somebody like us or Pat or Hugh with their business would have, um, you know, an incentive maybe to bid a higher price. So I think it, it does help. Um, and then the other, you know, people talk more broadly about uh, and I think the I think the FCC is looking at right now the question of aggregation. Like, is there a is there an amount that is too much in any one area? And you can there are ways to deal with that. You can have a an auction of you know 30 megahertz, and you say you know no carrier can acquire more than 15 in any one area um, or 10 or whatever the number is. You can I think there are ways to do it without being too heavy-handed. Um, you know, kind of going back to the, the 700 megahertz auction, um, you know, there was some of that spectrum that was set aside for public safety. And, uh, you know, now it looks like, um, you know, in the JOBS Act that Congress passed, they wanted to make sure that whatever equipment was uh, made for that, you know, it's the same equipment that's being used for commercial use. But it seems like Verizon is the only company that uh, has a similar band class. I mean, how, how does that affect you all in terms of trying to, to bid on business or, or any of you interested in, in, in working with public safety? And is that a limitation, I guess? Well, we do work with public safety in the state of Mississippi, and we are already interested in assisting public safety. The specifics of what Verizon has planned out, I'm not fully aware. But uh, working with public safety officials is, is just incumbent upon all of us, and I think those in this room have done that historically, and uh, that's something that we'll continue to do. Okay. Okay. And um, I think now we've got about 15 or, or 10 minutes. If there are audience questions out there, anybody? I've got more questions, but I wanted to give anybody out there a chance to ask any of these. to draw a distinction between the interference issue that you made and then the, the issue of, of uh, that occurred after the auction when the uh, we were all very surprised that when, it, when when the auction ended to see the other issue occur that, that I, think, I don't think anybody's actually ever mentioned I just want to make sure that you knew that the whole interoperability thing came up post auction when AT&T got the band class changed and so that was something that was a big big surprise whereas it wasn't a big surprise to anybody that there was going to be interference I just right. want to make that distinction okay okay you have a question over here? If you could tell us where you're from, too, that would be helpful. Hi, I'm Howard Busker with Communications Daily. We had a story last week in which, uh, in quick succession, AT&T officials and an executive from Verizon basically said, hey, you know, we're pretty good, we're in pretty good spectrum, shape as far as spectrum goes, you know, over the next couple years, you know, we're not real, 
And I'm just wondering, you know, I knew I was coming to this conference this week, and so I, I haven't really had a chance to talk to people about that, but this is kind of, I think, a soft lob for you all, but is, is the Spectrum Crunch more of a small carrier problem than it is for the big guys at this point, from what you can tell? I, just, I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on that. I, as far as uh, we've been able to study this pretty thoroughly over the last few years, uh, particularly because we were the first uh, 4G build out in, in the country. Uh, the spectrum crunch actually applies to everybody. Uh, there are some that are in a little bit better position than others, uh, but there's no doubt that over the next three to five years, there is uh, a definite spectrum crunch where many players are going to be left on the sidelines. Uh, so it applies to all the large carriers. I believe it applies to all the small carriers. And the, uh, the, the basis for that is what we're seeing in terms of growth of data. And the growth of data is so fast and so consumptive uh, that in order for us to continue to innovate, continue to deliver the service that customers are expecting, it really is a capacity model. It's not so much a coverage model down the path. And, and what we've experienced firsthand on our 4G data network, which is an unlimited data network, that's what we're providing, is that we see an insatiable demand on behalf of consumers. And we're just touching the surface. So when we talk about innovation, we're not, talk, not talking about just voice applications. We're talking about all of the new business development opportunities that are being created. New business models are being created every day. We start talking about how this space is going to fuel GDP and, and fuel United States growth. It is on mobile broadband data that a lot of these business models are established. Smartphone today is the most critical device out there. Uh, and certainly there are other devices that are uh, contemplated that are going to be equally, if not more, consumptive down the path. So the spectrum crunch is here. Now, the ability for us all to mobilize and actually help fuel that is all predicated on not only the availability of spectrum, but the efficiency of use of spectrum and, and supporting new business models to help create more capacity. That's wholesale models, that's roaming agreements, that's interoperability, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that the video is going to be driving so much capacity and it's not around the corner, it's, it's here now and it's just going to be a crunch and we always feel like we're kind of behind the eight ball. It's going, only going to get worse. So the crunch is here now and the crunch is going to get much worse and it's going to be universal. It's not going to pick on cities or rural. It's going to be all over and that's going to be one of the things that's going to drive small cells because that's going to be the alternative we're going to have. Is even with as much spectrum as we need, it won't be enough. We'll have to end up going with small cells to make sure that we can handle the demands that uh, we're going to see within the next five years. And, do, and just do, to answer your specific uh, question at the outset, I mean, I think it may not be the popular answer here, but I think it's probably true that uh, AT&T and Verizon in places uh, do lack uh, spectrum, do need more spectrum. As uh, you know, as demand grows, I mean, partly they have a they have a broader base of customers to serve, and and I think if you if you look at them, there's some metropolitan areas, greater metropolitan areas in particular, where they're you know somewhere they're stronger and somewhere they're thinner, and Spectrum is related to that. And that really does affect our customers as well. So yep. even if we're in in a rural area, our customers go to urban areas. So we we need the large carriers to have enough spectrum to continue to provide the services so that our customers get a quality service when they're traveling, but then that comes back to needing to have interoperability, devices that work across networks, and sufficient and attractive roaming agreements to make the whole ecosystem work the way it's intended. Okay, I think I saw some other hands. Go Do ahead. you believe uh, the all-you-can-eat is sustainable? And if not, how is all the, um, how are you going to monetize all the, uh, the data traffic? Let's take that one. I don't think it's substantial. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> turn it over. I, I don't. I don't think it's substantial. I think that there comes a point where it, it, there's there's so much demand that if you're going to make it uh, at one price, you better have an awfully high price, and I, eventually it's not going to be sustainable in my mind. But I'm certainly I probably have disagreements on that. No. I was going to say, Pat, do you offer unlimited, or have you? No. no. Okay. 
Yeah, we do offer it, and I think it's going to be very, very challenging. But don't ever underestimate the the amount of ingenuity and engineering prowess there is around the world, in this country and around the world. So who knows? But uh, right now it seems to be very, very challenging to sustain that. And from our perspective, certainly uh, in the indefinite future, we, we anticipate being able to sustain unlimited. Uh, this is front and center, the most customer-centric issue. Customers don't want to see uh, phone bills, uh, data bills, uh, growing exponentially. They want to be able to control it uh, and they want to be able to see the value that are being offered. Uh, we again have a unique position in the marketplace with the level of spectrum that we have that we can actually do that for a long period of time. Uh, and we think that it's a very customer centric view is look there's one bill, it's easy to understand, uh, you get what you pay for uh, and we're not going to we're not going to continue to upcharge you through time just because we can. But to follow up on that, though, I, you know, it seems to me that, you know, when things are unlimited, you don't really change consumer behavior. So, you know, like I always use the example of, you know, if I could just get unlimited uh, power in New York City, you know, on a hot summer day, I'd run that air conditioner all day long. So when I come home, it's nice and cool when I get there. But you know what? That costs way too much for me to be able to do that. So, you know, you're not changing any consumer behavior and you're all saying that, there is a shortage of spectrum. So, you know, is there, is, is the only reason to hold on to, to unlimited basically to uh, be able to compete with AT&T and Verizon? Well, we don't want to disincent. Okay. We, don't, we don't want to disincent customers from using it. Mm -hmm. You know, so much the same way, you know, it, it's not the perfect analogy or metaphor is, is power because okay. it, it is not the same. We got to utilize the spectrum that we've got in the most economical way on behalf of consumers in the U.S. Uh, and consumers today are, are calling for it. Now, what the, the structures that we have with large, with large carriers sitting at the top that can provide that disincentive to customers to utilize is not helping to spur innovation. It is not helping to create new applications. We, you, you touched on, Pat, you touched on video. Video is exactly that, that same thing. With video limitations today, nobody's incented to actually use video, a great new medium for delivering and communicating. Um, we think that we've got to utilize the spectrum that's available today the most efficient way possible. When we've consumed all of that, identify more or identify new ways of, of uh, delivering uh, the gigs at a more efficient way. But, but for the foreseeable future, we've got to be able to compete. We've got to be able to help uh, the others in this room compete. And that's what we're going to do. Mike? Well I, well, I think Clearwire's situation is different. I mean, I think, uh, you know, if I had a lot of available spectrum, I would, I would keep pushing that envelope because it's a differentiator and, and consumers love it. But I think there is a fairness issue because if you're just raising prices at a level over time to be able to support the, the abusers, the, the, the really heavy users, um, you know, the, the average customer is actually losing out. They're, they're paying more than they need to for that unlimited, so-called unlimited thing. So I, I think carriers have been working with kind of a middle ground where, you know, what, what I think is really offensive to customers is overages, right? And, you know, it's, especially when it's very hard to measure with data use or, or even being shut off. So can you, can, you know, the people are, a lot of carriers in this room are experimenting with various ways of throttling, right? So can you keep access up, but if people, but if people use too much, they're, they're starting to get, you know, a, a more constrained pipe to, so that you're able to let the rest of the customers continue to use at a reasonable level. And I think, you know, spectrum is finite. Um, I'm sure there'll be more innovation, but at the, at this moment in time, you know, you, we all the carriers have to weigh that. Yeah, I want to go back really quick to um, to the what was talked about in the the opening keynote here. You know, sort of this analogy that we've all used between the coffee industry and uh, and, and the phone. And what I have been thinking about, and what I think is interesting, is you know, you had Maxwell Health and Folgers, and they were you know selling people. Uh, not a, a great product, you know, it was, it was less in quality. And then you had Starbucks, the challenger, come on offering a higher quality product, but it was more expensive, right? We talked about the, you know, the $4 cup of coffee. I mean, who would have ever thought that you were going to pay $4 for a cup of coffee, right? Um, 
But what we see in the wireless industry in order to compete is a little bit different. Um, you know, we see the competition is really to try to undercut uh, AT&T and Verizon just to survive. And I'm just wondering, is that, um, is that a viable way to continue to compete? in this market? Or, uh, or do you become the quality provider? Do you become the Starbucks who can charge $4 for a cup of coffee when uh, you can get it a lot cheaper from the big guys? I, I, I disagree. I don't, I don't know that if all you're going to do is undercut the big guy, I think you lose. Um, they have uh, economies of scale in that. I think what you do is you provide a better quality of service. I think that's one of the things that T-Mobile was talking about. The, the, the advantage of you know having uh, operators that or uh, customer service people that actually answer the phone and talk to the customer directly and take care of their needs uh, on a single phone call rather than having them pass on and having them go through you know an electronic uh, answering service type of thing and the various various things that you can do to provide much better service I think than uh, your competition and I think that's what you have to go about it, it was strictly if you're just going to undercut I, I think you're going to go out of business. Yeah, and Maggie, down those lines, one of the things that we've done and have done effectively is personalize the experience for our, our users. We uh, use analytics to determine, and this is all at, with their permission, to determine the services and products and apps and all that best fits their needs. And uh, so it, it, uh, that's, that, there are a lot of other ways to compete other than price. Certainly price is a very visible component that we all talk about and all, but there are many other ways to compete, and we have a very talented management team and staff has put together a suite of personalized services that allows us to do things that uh, other carriers are not able to do. Okay. I think we probably have time for one more question and I think we probably, I have one last one if nobody else does. Maggie, I wonder if I can go back to one of your points. You, sure. You talked about uh, the, um, I'm trying to think what it was now, the, the fact that, well, uh, go ahead and ask the question. I can't. Okay. <laughs> um, well, iPhone 5 just came out. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, I know some of you are, are offering that, and a lot of competitive carriers are now starting to offer the iPhone 5. How important is that device uh, to your business and your ability to compete? And um, what do you think? Uh, regulators or should be doing to, to ensure that everybody has access to the hottest devices? Who wants to take that one? Well, I think the interoperability issue plays into that. It would be easier for Apple and, and all the manufacturers to build if there was interoperability that was mandated by the FCC. So I think that's not only good for Apple, but that's good for everybody who makes devices in our space. And that's, that's how I'd answer that. One thing that I've, I find really interesting about the iPhone is that you know Apple is the only manufacturer that has been able to dictate I am going to build one device and uh, you know I'll put all the the components in there and then it's the same device that's sold to everyone. That's not really the same for for other device manufacturers. Do you think that's a game changer and is that good for your industry? Like we're seeing that the Verizon iPhone, for example, uh, iPhone five is you can put a SIM card in it. You can use it on other carriers. This is huge, right? Uh, at least I think it's huge from a consumer standpoint. I mean, what do you all think about that? Is that only an Apple phenomenon, or is that something that we can expect to see I down think, the road? I think you're going to see it in other uh, uh, manufacturers as well. We think the Apple phone is, uh, has been great for the industry. Uh, you know, it's been a, a great product for us. We're, we'll roll out the iPhone 5 on, on Friday. And we're, we're excited about the product, and we know that we'll sell a, a lot of those. It's just... They, they really got it. I think that you're going to see Samsung coming out with products a lot closer to the Apple uh, in the future where software is going to be more dominant than hardware. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, th I think it's a good thing. Well, Samsung's already doing it. A number of, a number of providers are already doing it. They're, you know, it's the, it's the Galaxy S3. You know, it's, it's not Galaxy exactly. S3. I don't think the components are all exactly the same, right? I mean, I think, isn't there a CDMA version and a GSM version? Yes, the, there but is, but, yeah. but, so but is there's, it, so is Apple. I mean, they're, you know, just the fact that you're able to put in that card, I mean, that's, that's just because that's, you know, that's the capability of the LTE phone and what they do for roaming uh, outside the U.S., I think. But I think it's good, it's good for carriers uh, to have, you know, a common device. I mean, devices, are absolute table stakes right mm -hmm. now. They're, 
they're the driving, um, you know, they're, they're the driving decision uh, maker really for a lot of uh, customers, particularly postpaid customers. Mm -hmm. And um, so anything that can be done to level that playing field is going to be helpful. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us and for the audience for, for being here and participating. So thanks a lot. Thank Congratulations. Uh, stay seated for just a minute. Uh, let me uh, wrap up here. Again, thank you for the, uh, for the discussion, Maggie. Thank you so very much for our distinguished panel. Uh, before we end the session, I'd like to point out something uh, that you might find very useful the rest of the time you're at the convention. That is, uh, we've created a, two, uh, a CCA 12, 2012 app. And you can, uh, for the entire event, so you can uh, go access the, um, uh, your app store and look for uh, CCA uh, 2012. You can download it. It gives you the, uh, all the schedule, the names of all of our speakers, backgrounds, bios, uh, where everything is located, maps. Uh, I hope you'll uh, download it, use it, uh, and get more out of the experience here and uh, find out who else is here uh, joining, uh, joining you. Um, uh, with that, I would like to say thank you to everyone that's uh, going to go to the exhibit hall next. And we'll open that at 1030. And I hope you'll go check it out. I encourage you to visit the exhibit booths. And, um, and then we're going to uh, serve lunch from, 10, uh, from 1130 to 1. And um, that's sponsored by Light Squared. Thank you, Light Squared. And uh, they're sponsoring lunch. And then we'll pick up right, right back here at 1 o'clock with some speakers. And we're going to have the awards presentation. Our annual awards presentation will occur in the second uh, portion uh, with some interesting speakers. And so hope you go enjoy yourself in the hall and get something to eat and uh, come back ready to go. Thank you. Bye.